Aole e kawika purima Eaha Balunda o kapepa o ka enemi Eaha O o hui ai na u ai ewa Ika pono si vila o ke ka na ka I'm going to uh, talk a, real quick about the objectives of this meeting because we're in a position where we need to be really precise and almost surgical with our, our, our dialogue and our discussion. Um, so I just want to talk about what this is, what this isn't. Yeah. What this is is a meeting to talk about the impacts and implications of this Na'i Aupuni process to understand how it came to be and to look at what, um, what the pros and cons are, what the negative impacts, what's at risk for us as a Lahui, to really come in with some critical analysis and attempt to look at it with a critical eye and see how is this going to affect us, how can this impact us. I think we're all here, most of us, if not all of us, because we know that Na'i Aupuni is not going to be a good thing for our people. And we're here because we feel that the process of how it came to be has been very disassociated from the Lahui, yeah? um, in the design and in the implementation. And I think we can validate that very easily. How many of you participated in Choosing whether we wanted to have Act 195, Kanai Oluvalu, Ho'olahui, Na'i Aupuni. Raise your hand. That's the evidence, yeah? Um, the majority of our people have been disassociated from this process. And we're here to, to acknowledge those feelings and be sincere about it. That, you know, many of us didn't know where Act 195 came from. And everything after that was just brand new news to us. We were never part of our own self-determination design. Therein lies the problem. Um, so this meeting is not about trying to argue the merits of participation in Na'i Puni. This meeting is not about trying to understand how we can go in and control this process in a way that's going to be pono for our lahui. Most of us believe that we will not be able to control this process. And so we're very concerned about it. Um, this meeting is not about rehashing Hawaiian history. Everybody here knows about the overthrow and the subsequent series of illegalities. We don't need to talk about that. We all know. We all know our history. What we, what we want to do is we want to get into the meat of understanding Na'i Aupuni, how it's going to work, what the potential implications are, um, <clears throat> and also understanding how has it violated principles of self-determination. The highest standards of human rights have not been met. That, that's our belief, and that's why we're holding this halavai. Um, we also want to talk about what kind of things we can do as a lahui to regain control of our self-determination yeah? and not let this, this um, process be forced upon us in ways that are um, utilizing fear and exclusion. And all of us know fear and exclusion has been a powerful tool for this process. And that's not pono for our people. Yeah? Um, So that's, what's this, that's what this meeting is about. I just want to remind everybody to please be cautious. We don't want to revisit the history. We want to be real precise, understanding Na'i Puni, and also understanding the new DOI rules that just came out and how they are connected to Na'i Puni, yeah? How they're spliced in. Some people will argue that there are two separate things. They are, but they're really not. We understand politics and how it works. They're very much connected, and we're going to seek to try to um, bring more um, deeper understanding about that. To summarize, um, throughout this whole process, this genealogy of nation building and stuff, we can see clearly, there's no doubt in my mind, and I think, I believe, hopefully most of you or all of you agree, 
Principles of self-determination have been violated, have not been met in the least. There's never been a neutral process. State recognition is going to happen even if federal recognition fails. And we see that there's an underlying agenda to settle Hawaiian claims over national lands. That claim that Antinani pointed out, we've never acquiesced our claim over national lands, is about to happen this way if the sort of the backdoor, the backdoor dealings happen for a global settlement. Um, federal recognition threatens international claims to independence. Um, with the deal I was here, Department of Justice Attorney and Nanakuli was here, I asked him, would federal recognition preclude independence? He said, I can't answer that. Um, I asked Professor Chang to look at Indian law, Indian law, U.S. Code 25, Section 371, basically says, no native tribes shall seek independence. The Constitution, the United States Constitution is self-preserving, set up to never see territory back. So, it could never be recognized as an independent country through U.S. law. It's set up to prevent that. Um, what we believe is we have a corrupt process, we'll end up with a corrupt outcome. Because of all of this history, many of us have chosen that participation is unprincipled, that we just can't muster up the willingness to participate in something that's so rotten. Yeah. I believe you cannot make a good meal with starting with rotten food. Um, we believe that participation, even by our, by our independence friends and allies, they will not get in. They will not be able to control this thing. It's going to be set up to be controlled by the people who designed it, and that participation will only serve to validate and legitimize the outcome. Mahalo Nui. And now I want to talk about the impact of uh, this, because you do have all these rights, and the night or all these potential, you, you do have the potential to assert all these rights, right, and, and, and convince uh, an important section of the world to support you. But if you uh, sign on or are believed to have signed on by the world community to uh, a project uh, document that, in, that integrates you with the U.S., then you have chosen integration with another state as opposed to independence. And if they read it that way, they will not interfere in the internal affairs of a member state. So that's the, the problem. You know, your assent must never be given if you wish to retain your option of independence. Your assent to integration is your most, most powerful tool, legally speaking. Now, so that's if, okay, if you assent to be recognized, you have assent to be integrated, and that is very, very dangerous to your international law rights. But I would like to end with this. It is not only assenting to recognition by the federal government that is dangerous. It is the mere fact that you allow a non-representative, elitist, uh, oppressor, a sponsored government to even come into existence. That alone, whether the, the gets recognition or not from the federal government is already extremely dangerous because the U.S., whether it recognizes you or not, will act as if this is truly your government and decide all matters through the government and the state will do likewise and they will encourage corporations to negotiate directly with that government to destroy your resources. And then as this practice piles up, the international community itself will say, well, you have not formally consented, but you have in practice consented because your government, you know, represents you. So that's very dangerous. Second thing about Aloha Aina, which is oh, it's a invoke word for many people today, mm. and that's good. But part of it also is a false consciousness about the word Aloha Aina. See, Aloha Aina is not just about who will pick up the rubbish over there. Stop them from spraying things over there. Alawaiana is the core of our identity. As I was told, wherever we walk upon this land, we walk upon our ancestors. Whatever food we eat from this land, we eat of our ancestors. See, that's Alawaiana. That is us. The land is us. The job of the oppressor and the dominant.
payment, maybe some rental, ooh, maybe some uh, entitlements. That's the confusion. But Allah Ayna is the sin. But a great speaker is himself. You want to go to Nabahi, you want to talk wise, you want to talk Kalao Kalani. What did Kalao Kalani say? Until the last.
We never had the chance to do that. And I'll tell you right now, I look on Facebook, you know who's celebrating this, this Nahi Alpuni, this DOI rules? Robin Danner celebrating, they're happy. When they're happy, my Naho will tell me something wrong. Um, also want to take the time to really mahalo our, our auntie, um, Kaiolani Lambert and her ohana for bringing the food. part of our planning committee and helping with the video and uh, setting up. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll and for those of the Nahiyao Puni, I don't care what they say, you can paint them 20 different ways. It's still a creation of the state. I don't care if you're in separate organization. Let's get real. Andre already showed Act 195. The role was created by the state of Hawaii in 2011. And then in 2013, because the numbers were so low, what we're going to do, we're going to do this last minute amendment, and we're going to add everybody else who had been on any other registry, as Andre said, to increase the numbers, to inflate the numbers, to now they have over $100,000, I mean 100,000 people registered on Nahiyao Puni. So, what I wanted to touch on with the Nahiyao Puni process, what I already said, it's state law, guys. I don't care if they can keep saying, well, Nanyang Puni is a separate organization. It was still created. The role itself was created by the state of Hawaii. The other point was, is that this idea or this notion by people of independence that will now suddenly, if I participate in Nanyang Puni, I can advocate for independence. All I gotta say is people just honestly get real because <laughs> let's get back to Kanayi okay? When that was created, there was a commission and they were appointing who was going to be on the commission. There's an at-large seat on that commission. And the commissioners wanted to put a non-resident. He doesn't, he's not a resident of the state of Hawaii. He was actually Suli. He was the former head of the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs. They wanted him to have a seat because they wanted the voice of Hawaiians who live outside of Hawaii to be a part of the process. And basically, the state law, state of Hawaii law says, boards and commissions, you have to be a resident of the state. So tell me how you're going to allow other opportunities, other processes, independence and whatnot, if you can't even get one commissioner who's a non-resident. Okay, so for me, um, the real threat, the thing that they're claiming they're doing this for is the legal challenges, right? Constantly getting challenged. 15th Amendment, that's the reason why we're doing this, we need a recognized entity. Well, let's be real people. Our rice fee Kayatano, they keep trying to say, well, not yet, we're not going to be subject to the rice fee Kayatano challenge. There's already a complaint filed in federal court calling for the 15th Amendment challenge and the 14th Amendment challenge. And, you know, I don't want to get into too much legalese, but when you really look at it, the fact that it was a state law, and that role is limited to only those who are of Hawaiian ancestry, I don't see how it could withstand a legal challenge. Even if it's not Iyapuni, an entity they try to claim is separate from the state of Hawaii. So all I want to leave you folks with, in my humble opinion, just coming from my, my na'a, my kumbai, is, first of all, I'm going to
burn your ballot. If they're going to be on the list, burn your ballot. Don't vote. And if we have over 100 something thousand people registered and we have a low number, does that really represent the will of our community? And Camille is going to touch on the, what the DOI rules is requiring in terms of, of numbers. And I just would encourage, if we can meet that number, get that number under, then Nani Puni, as far as I'm concerned, is, is out of, is out of, um, out of basically participating in that process. So with that, I just want to turn it over.
havai i moku ke ave e a Kokuwa na honoa opi i lai 